Hey, we're singing our faith, and I want to share with you, this is, this uh, Psalm 95 is really like a doctrine of worship, and uh, we're going to look at that, and we're going to see how, how our singing faith ties into that. Here we go. So the Duke of Wellington, I'm a history guy. The Duke of Wellington, the British military leader, defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. He's known as a harsh guy, just difficult to work with, to work for, uh, demanding, fairly ruthless with his own troops, and slow to ever give a compliment, to ever affirm, to ever encourage, just expectation after expectation after expectation. And I think he may have mellowed near the end of his life. He was asked, if you were going to do all of your career as a military, really genius, if you're going to do that military career all over again, would you do anything differently? And he said, I would bestow much more praise on the people who work uh, and serve under me. Now, that's good. That's a good policy for a whole lot of things. We ought to be much more affirming, encouraging, blessings on the people around us just in our everyday relationships but how much more in relationship to God I don't want to get to the end of my life and look back on my life and say well I asked God for a lot of stuff and and I complained to God about a lot of stuff but I didn't spend much time praising God for and praise is different than thanks you know thanks is important too uh we enter his gates with thanksgiving. It's a great way to approach God, but praise for God is just saying back to God, God, this is who you are. God, this is, what, this is who you are in your person, in your works, in your glory. And we're not good at this part of it. And that's one of the reasons why we need to be a singing faith. The Psalms really give us the language of praise. And over and over again in my my time with the Lord, I just need to, I have, a, I have a folder that just has verses from the Psalms that are praised. That just speak back to God how wonderful He is. And it's not like God doesn't know how wonderful He is, but He wants us to say it back to Him. And I need the language of the Psalms to do it. And so that's, that's a praise. We ought to give more praise to God. Now, why should you praise the Lord? Why should you worship Almighty God? Well, here's some pretty good reasons that work well for me. One, how about this? The Bible says to. Now, there are a lot of things that the Bible says to do that we completely ignore. And this is often one of them, is we say, well, I'll serve God. I'll do stuff for God. I'll try to be a good person for God. But to worship God is just a different expression of our love for God. And it's an important, and it can't be set aside quickly or easily. The Bible says, this is the 150th Psalm, the last of the Psalms, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Okay, so any of you taking breath today? Congratulations, you're on board for this one. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We'll do some more practicing of that here in a minute. Praise is where God dwells, where God lives. And you say, well, God's everywhere. God's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time, right? That's God. But the Bible says the Lord inhabits the praises of His people. He, he is especially present in the worship of His people, in the presence of His people. That's why don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. Don't stop getting together with other believers to worship God. I can do a whole, I'm going to worship God tomorrow morning around 7 o'clock. My Bible's open, and I'm going to have my personal time with God, expressing my worship, my love, my gratitude to Him. But if I stop getting together with a lot of other people doing that, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, just start to dry up when it comes to worship. And you, you get a couple of weeks away from gathering together with other people, it starts to wilt on the vine. And it's important that we gather with other believers, because God inhabits the praises of His people. Praise, also worship, that, that is all about God. It just chases away despair. For a lot of people, they're calling out to God. You can call out to God for a long time. And I have been in this spot where, God, you got to help me with this crisis in my life. And I'll ask and I'll ask and I'll ask. And, and if it's not coming quickly, easily, soon, I, I, I start feeling like I, I'm going to break under the weight of this. 
and praise to God, saying, okay, instead of thinking about me all the time and what I need and what I want, let me talk to God about who He is and what He has done and how glorious He is and how wondrous His works in the world. I want to take my eyes off of me and put my eyes on God completely in my worship. Uh, the burdens just get a lot lighter and the clouds seem to part for me and that's uh, my experience. Now, your whole life, is the Bible teaches us, is an expression of worship, declaring, celebrating our love for God. And He's a God who loved us first. And we'll dig into that here shortly. But it's also true, we are called by God to get together with other believers. There's a lot of people that just neglect this part. Well, I, it's just me and God. We live, American Christianity is so tilted in the wrong direction on this from a biblical perspective. We are so me and God driven. It's all about me and God. And almost everything in expression of relationship to God in the Bible is a we and God expression. Worship is a us together expression of relationship to God. And that's how God's designed it to be lived. And when we start making an individualistic, self-centered kind of thing, it's not going to reflect a biblical value. It's not going to reflect a biblical economy. It's not going to reflect biblical priorities. And it's going to stop being about God pretty quick. It's going to be all about us. Now, here's verse 1 of Psalm 95. Come, let us shout joyfully. Shout! Wow. You reserved Baptist crowd. Woo! Shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joy, shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand. The mountain peaks are his. The sea is his. He made it. His hands form the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are his peop the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. And then there's this weird little thing that tries to connect to the next verse, but I don't think it needs to. Today, if you would hear his voice, and I think it needs to stop right there. And that's how we're going to do it today. Now, let's walk through these verses quickly. First, there's an invitation to worship God. We find it in verse 1. We find it in verse 6. He is calling us into this, this experience. An invitation to worship God. The pattern is repeated by word and example throughout the record of God's word to his people. We are invited over and over again. You get all the way to the last chapter of the last book in the Bible. Three times, the spirit and the bride say, come, 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 come to me. The Lord says, it's an invitation. God is reaching out to us. Think about the nature of God. Is that God's a God of revelation. He makes himself known. He's not trying to keep himself hidden from us, secret from us, separate from us. He wants us to know him. He wants to reveal himself in all of his glory to us. So this is an important principle. We come to worship God at God's initiative. How can you identify when it's God inviting you? How do you know when it's God reaching out to you? And uh, these are some things that have been helpful to me. A couple of things. First one is, in our sinfulness, we would never come to God unless He first drew us. Even as a believer, having an, a fairly disciplined believer for me, I would, never, I would never turn to God in worship unless I was responding to the invitation He has already given me. The Holy Spirit says, come. You're here today by God's invitation. Now, here's the thing. There were thousands of people in Collin County today who received the same invitation from the Lord. God touched them with it. You ought to. You need to get up. You need to go. You need to gather with some other people who love Jesus and you need to worship. And a lot of people hit the snooze, snooze alarm on that today. I'm proud of you because you didn't need not. I'm sad for the people who who ignored an invitation of Almighty God. In our sinfulness, the only reason you think about it, the only reason it stirs in you, is because God has planted it there. And that makes it vitally important that you be sensitive to the Word of God when it comes to you, inviting you to worship. 
Second thing, in our sinfulness, we'd never take any step toward God. Even as believers, unless God first reached out to us. Worship is not just for the church house, most certainly. Again, this is the practice. This, this informs and strengthens and enriches the worship that we're going to do all week long. But when, when you go through your day and you have a prompt that you should pray. A prompt. Did you read your Bible today? A prompt. Why don't you offer to pray for that person that just expressed something that is wearing them out and weighing them down? Any of those, I sense I should do something that really ties in with this, this whole book here. That is the prompt that is the word of God to your life. And none of us, without that invitation to God, would respond to it. When God begins to speak, there's really nothing more important than listening to what he has to say to you and responding affirmatively, quickly, and obediently. What does it mean to worship? So in this doctrine of worship, the whole word worship means at its core, it's, it's a word that means bow down. That means I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I've got a humility before God. He is over me. I am, I am following after him. He's a He's more important than I am. His agenda is greater priority than whatever I had planned for my day. He is God, and I am not. And you think, that, well, that's a silly statement. Of course, God is God. Is he really? See, your God, I mean, he's a great king above all gods, we learn. The reason we have uh, this little statement is because there are lots of gods. Because your God's whatever you value most. I mean, there's only one God. But we have a lot of small, little g-gods that we chase after all the time. We have, uh, we have other things that determine how we spend our time, how we exercise our talents, how we uh, expend our resources. We have gods that determine how our calendar runs. We're choosing all the time our God. And whatever is the most important thing in your life is where you're going to go. That's the direction of your life. And it's not hard to look at your calendar, look at the last week of your life and say, what was really my God? Who was my God this week? And it may not be anywhere close to this God. What happens when, you're, when you have a choice, right? I can choose the Lord God or I can choose a hundred other things. And we can always say, well, God's first, and then family, and then, you know, whatever you throw in is your third thing. But truthfully, do an account for your time in the course of a week, and you'll discover God's really on the periphery of things. Who is your God? That which you value most, that which directs your life. God calls us to worship, but that does not rule out a chorus of competing voices for our affections, attentions, and commitments. That's where the flow of life goes, and that's where we find our God. The first verse of this chapter implies our worship needs to be directed to God because there are a lot of other possibilities. So, what are you going to choose? We're choosing every day, and we're choosing multiple times during the day. Here's our motivation for worship. We worship God for a lot of different reasons. Let me touch on a few, and these are just core things from this chapter he's the rock of our salvation he's the one who saves us from our sin he's the one who sets us free from the penalty of sin that would separate us from God for all eternity and he's made a way through Jesus Christ his son for our sin to be forgiven for us to have a walking through life living relationship with God and for us to be with him forever and eternity and that is an incredible gift and that if he never did anything else is worthy of everything we've got in our worship for his majesty and his might. Now you think about this. In our culture, we will stand in line for the opportunity to see someone famous do something uh, that famous people do. Right? We are a celebrity worshiping culture in all kinds of ways. We'll cheer for them. We'll pay large sums of money to see them. We'll cherish their autographs to get to see them in person. It's so special. And why? Because they can sing a song, because they can hit a ball, or because uh, they can memorize lines and then say them in front of a camera. David, David's recording these, these, these worship words, and David, he's a celebrity. 
everybody loves David. Everybody wants to be with David. Everybody, he's, he's a warrior. He's a poet. He's a king. He's done, he's done it all. He's a builder. Yet, David bows down and humbles himself before Almighty God because he knows there's only one worthy of worship. Watch care. God cares for us, the Bible here says, like, like a shepherd cares for his sheep. He protects his sheep. He guides the sheep to still waters and green pastures. Uh, we'll, we'll learn in the, here shortly in the 23rd Psalm, and we'll be studying that. He looks after us. All the things God does for us, we should acknowledge him in our personal worship. We acknowledge him when we get together like this for the great things he has done in his watch care. The object of our worship, uh, and this just breaks it out a little bit. The verses use some different names for our God. He is Lord. He is God. He is King. He is Creator. He's the clear object of our worship. And what happens in a lot of places in the Bible is that there are different nuances of our God's uh, expression to us and in our world. And those nuanced names for God reveal things about Him to us. Here's the first one. He is Lord. Lord means that He is uh, the God of the covenant. That's the, that's the name that when Moses was at the burning bush, God said, you tell them the Lord sent you. It's my special covenant relationship name. It, he's, a, he's not a God that is just off out there somewhere. He's a God of relationship, and he is in it with you. That word Lord, when it, when it shows up in the Bible, is the capital o, L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Is that covenant name for God? There's a capital L, small O-R-D. It's a different word for God. This is the big sweeping expression of who God is and what God does. And Lord means, is actually a, it's a verb form. He's the one who is. He's the one who was. He's the one who will be. He is the eternal one. He is not going anywhere, and you can count on him. He is the great God. And that just establishes the field. Because you have this world, we said earlier, of competing gods. It just designates there's only one. And that does not mean that you're not going to have a struggle every day in your commitments to a whole lot of lesser gods, materialism, power, position, other people. And we have to ask, who is the object of your affections? Who is the object of your commitments, the object of your worship? He's a great God. He is the king, which means he rules. He's not, he's not an advisor that you can factor in his advice in the course of your day to determine, well, you know, Here's another opinion. Let's see what God has to say. And then I'll weigh the multitude of opinions that are being thrown my way, the different ways I could do things. But no, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he rules and he reigns. He's the creator. We worship the creator. All things came into being by him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life. He's the giver of life. Life abundant, life eternal, life complete, life forever with him. And we worship God who spoke the world into existence. And he is the source of life, the sustainer of life. He holds it all together and he deserves our heartfelt worship. Then we have this method of worship. And a couple of key components in how we do worship here from a biblical perspective. This passage gives a good description of what it takes when we worship together. There are a lot of things that take place in a worship experience. But singing is always a part of it in God's Word. And it has to be a part of it, we feel like, in, in our expression. You know, there are, there are just over 400 references to singing as our expression of worship in the Bible. That There are 50 specific commands to sing as your expression of worship. Not suggestions, commands in the Word of God to sing. You say, well, I'm not much of a singer. Well, congratulations on your disobedience to God and your willingness to sin in church. Amen. Because that's what disobedience is. It's sin. We've got to quit playing with sin, my friends. You get, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not much of a reader. I don't like to read my Bible. Congratulations. God just missed that completely, that you did not like 
his delivery method. Therefore, you choose to live in sin forever. Do you see how this works? You either obeying God or you're disobeying God, and we're making choices all the time. Now, joyful singing is another thing. I know it was a noisy, stormy night last night. And many of us spent a good portion of it awake. But I, and I just didn't have the courage during our first song this morning, which is a real upbeat, positive song, to turn around and watch you sing it. Because I just felt it would disappoint me so I would just go on home for the rest of the day. When you sing, is it an overflow of a heart that's all full of love for Jesus? Can you sing in that way? Could you not sing in that way? Oh, my. Loud and joyful. By the way, you're going to have some plenty of opportunity here in just a moment to try again. But sometimes we sing loud and joyful. But we look at these psalms. And Jimmy and I both have touched on different ones where sometimes we're singing a lament because it's hard. Sometimes we're singing confession because we're guilty. Sometimes uh, we're singing... Uh, in a meditative uh, method, uh, expression of music. But we are singing faith. Now, the other part of how worship flows with us, because we're a Bible-focused church, which makes us different than a lot of traditions that are out there, is we are guided, informed, directed by the Word of God. And so we share God's Word in our worship experience. The third aspect of worship here found in uh, verse 6, to bow down, to kneel before the Lord. This part of worship may be the most important of all. This is a, this is a real attitude of the heart thing. It's we, we come in and we just all bowed up with life and we need to soften our hearts and we need to acknowledge God's place in our lives. It's an attitude of the heart that says, I need God and I love Him. <laughs> because of all he is, all he has done, and all he will do. And then our opportunity for worship. Sometimes we try to connect, uh, this is where I stopped earlier, that last part of verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice, and then a lot of folks, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, and he goes into one of the stories from the life of Moses and how they disobeyed, but I, I like to end where... Most translation, where, where the verses are typically grouped here. If you would hear his voice. If you would hear his voice. Because it reminds us we're making a decision every time we worship God. There's a choice to be made. If, says, this could go any direction. If. Worship has to be a part of the life of a fully developing follower of Christ. And the psalmist here says, adore him and do it. Do it now. Don't wait. God has given you opportunity right now. Don't waste this. Don't, don't drop this like a hot rock. You hang on to this and you lean into it. Worship takes priority and precedence over all else because when you love Jesus, you belong to him. You're one of his people. You say, I'm going to heaven when I die because of Jesus in my heart. Worship just has to be the expressive overflow of a heart filled full with the Lord. So we worship our Lord.